guest tonight, uh, this morning, sorry, our guest this morning has a long story to tell. He started as a street boy, he became a policeman, went to the special branch, knew about uh, Robert Oko's death, became a refugee, and he studied law at length. Now he wants to be your president. We are talking about Mr. George Wajakoya. Welcome. Professor Wajakoya. You are now a professor. <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> but we knew you as a fugitive and a madman. Yes. Yes. Tell us right. a little bit about your background from childhood. Well, uh, in short, it can yes. take a whole day. But in yes, short, uh, yeah. my parents divorced when I was a young boy in Western Province in Mumias. And I was left for the custody of my grandparents. Life became very difficult. Then, without going into nitty gritties, I strolled away from home to Nairobi, where I became a street boy for years until the Hare Krishna picked us from the streets. And I remember having featured in a newspaper story by Sam Kahiga in 1977 as one of the, those boys who was picked up by the Hare Krishna to be taken to the temple. While at the temple, some Asian Samaritans came in and uh, they took me to their school, paid for my fees, and that's how I grew up. And uh, after that, you become a policeman? Yes, uh, after, that, after my A-levels, unfortunately, I, couldn't, I, couldn't, I didn't get enough grades to go to the university, though I passed. I joined the police as a police constable, worked at Central Police Station for some years, before I went back to Kiganjo to train as a police inspector. And then from there, I was returned back to the city, Pangani Police Station. Then I was enrolled in the security intelligence, where I worked until my detention. And why were you detained? Well, um, as fate may take it, I was one of the officers who was designated to investigate the case of the late uh, Honorable Minister Robert Uko. And uh, when the findings were not uh, pleasing, um, some of us were transferred and I was detained. What findings did you find out? Well, I cannot um, speak on the findings right now because the case is in court. And uh, no it, will, court. It, will, it will be contempt of court. The case is in British courts. It has been there. And what, uh, what, court, what court case is this? Well, uh, those mentioned in the case, as published by the British newspapers by that particular time, uh, filed a petition in the British courts. And I cannot discuss it or even mention because the case is still pending. I don't understand. Uh, Kenya is not uh, under British colonial rule. So whatever happened, court cases take place in Britain, they have nothing to do with us. Let me bring and it to you. Uh, and, and, and I don't know anyway, who has filed a case against who? Well, those mentioned in the story. Which who story? In the story that uh, was published in the British press. Emanating from whom? From the complainants, whom I'm not going to mention because I can't mention. But also, by the way, let me correct you here. Uh, Kenya is a signatory to international law. Therefore, it's obligated to observe the jurisdiction's findings of other courts. In which case, if I mention it here, it may amount to contempt of court. And I do not want it to go that way now that I'm running for the presidency of this country. Uh, what you are saying is that um, you cannot discuss why you are detained. Well. As I said before, I said, and I'll repeat it very uh, clearly, that I was involved in the investigation yes. of the late minister, Robert Uko. Yes. And whatever was found was communicated back to the government, particularly to my superiors. But then, because of that case, I ended up in detention. Yes. Of which I'm not going to give specifics. And then after that, I went to Britain through a good Samaritan who helped me to flee the country. Who is that? Uh, the late Smith Hempstone, yeah. the U.S. ambassador, who was concerned with my safety. How did you get from detention to ambassador uh, Smith Hempstone? Well, house? I did not know what might have been happening while mm. I was in, in, incarcerated. But I was released temporarily. And the story that I know right now is he might have wanted to know what was happening with me. Because while I was working in the intelligence, we also had a group of foreigners who were working with us, and probably it could have been some of those people that were working with us that were concerned about my arrest. 
they might have mentioned, and I'm not sure on this, but they might have mentioned about my whereabouts, and that might have led to um, the, the, the American government through Smith Hempstone wanted to find out. And as you know, that, that case was very sensitive. A lot of people lost their lives. Probably somebody wanted to save my life, and maybe he saved it, and of course he did. So anyway, after the tension, you go to Britain. Yes, I, I went to Britain where I became a refugee, and I was a grave digger there for seven years while I was going to law school. Then in graves? Yes, sir. Uh-huh. And yes. then? Yes, and I went to law school. I finished my bachelor's of law. Then I did my first master's. I did my second master's. I did a third master's. And I continued until I started my own law practice in Hackney, in London, where I was practicing immigration law. Then a few years later, I decided to cross the Atlantic to go and study the laws of the United States at Baltimore University, of which I did, and um, I took the Washington DC bar. And then I also became an adjunct professor of law, international comparative law, at American Heritage University, while I was also visiting a uh, visiting, uh, professor to other institutions, including Britain. Why do you, have, why do you need all those master's degrees? Yeah, because, you know, uh, as a street, about five of them. It could be more. If we count diplomas, yes, I have more diplomas than five. But what I wanted was, I wanted to do something. I wanted to do something for my country. I wanted to make my country very proud. I wanted to make police officers also to have hope and destiny that whatever they do, they can always achieve something different, just like what the late Bishop Alexander Muge was. He was a police con uh, corporal, and he rose up to to be a bishop. Uh, Mandela in South Africa, I'm told, was a policeman, and he rose up to be a president. And, I, and because I lacked education as a street boy, because I lacked people to assist me to reach wherever I could have reached, I wanted actually to try to establish a new paradigm in life so that I could also uh, give others hope. I could also emulate others and let them know that you cannot give up when there is hope. And that's how I decided to become a permanent student, but it paid at the, at the end, and that's why I'm running for president. Tell us, you have been out of this country from 1991 or 92? Yes, 92 January. 92 January? Yes. You have been out of this country? I've been out. Just arrived about two months ago? Well, the first time I came was last year when I came to register, and then register as a voter. And uh, two months ago, I came back now to launch my campaign, of which I had launched 22 months ago while in the diaspora, as the first Kenyan in the diaspora to launch presidential campaign. We launched where? If you launch a presidential... In the United States. How does that help you, launching a presidential campaign in America? We have three million Kenyans in the U.S. and Britain, in the diaspora, who are now eligible to vote in the new constitution. Then we have also over 10 million Kenyans who are of Asian ethnicity. So if you count, if you put that, the two numbers together, and these people take advantage of that, then we shall have 13 million Kenyans. And because Kenyans abroad have, have worked so hard to keep this country going during those 24 years of misrule, they have a duty to this country. They have a cause to fight for as they have been fighting for. Because lots of people do not know that Kenyans abroad have really done a lot to bring justice in this country by lobbying international community, by participating in different formats to make the international community realize that things were not right at home. And they're only doing that because they wanted to set this country free. So when the new constitution came up, they took advantage and they said, you know what, this is our time, we need to go back home and participate instead of being spectators or speculators. And that's why I decided to join hands with those Kenyans outside to speak the same language and also to start a new face of Kenyan politics. Can you tell us what role you have played in um, terms of struggle when you are away? Yes. What, what is it you have done? I mean, uh, uh, I've been, I've, I think I'm one of those Kenyans who have felt so much cold outside because of the protests that we carried in number 10 Downing Street. We have fought, we have lobbied the, US, the British government by that particular time. I personally, when I was at, at the University of London, uh, School of Oriental and African Studies doing my master's and as a student leader I was instrumental in bringing in Koigi Wamwere, Dennis Akumu, I mean Honorable Dennis Akumu, uh, Dr. Liki, 
Professor Wangari Madai at SOAS to speak and to tell the world from inside on what was go happening in this country. We have also, we, we, I also joined the protests. That's so what you mean, School of Oriental and African Studies? Yes, yes, mm -hmm. yes. Yeah. So I also joined other <coughs> like-minded Kenyans, like Bamtum Swale, uh, Honorable um, Wanyiri Kehoro, who, pe who played a, a very big role, Ablatif. Uh, Abdulatif of Abdallah. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, and... Uh, um, uh, um, Sal Salam, Zahur Salam from the coast and the coastal community, members of the coastal community that had come in the UK because of what had happened to Sheikh Balala. So we did a lot of protests and uh, we became known as the enemies of the state and that's why the government of President Moy was on our heels there worse than even here. So we've done a lot 